Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is a social psychologist and author. Dr. Susan Newman is also a contributor to Psychology Today, a mother of one and previously a stepmother of four. Dr. Newman is a leading expert on parenting only children, and she joins us today from New York. Thank you so much for taking the time. Happy to be here. Let's start, if we could, with your current assessment of how society views parents of single children. Completely differently than they did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. Um, at that point, um, even when I had my son, they said, you can't do that to your child. Your child has to have a sibling. And um that has totally changed. At this point in time in 2024, uh, we've moved to acceptance of the only child family. Uh, more and more people want an only child for assorted reasons. Um, only child families are not looked down upon. Uh, you're not, you know, you, if you have one child, you are in fact a family. Um, and that is different from you have to have a boy and you have to have a girl and live in a house with a white picket fence because that's not reality anymore. So what then are the key contributing factors to this transition and shift? The transition comes from a host of factors. Uh, w one being more and more women are working. I think 70% of women who have children are working now. Um, uh, before that, they're staying in school longer. Hence, women are starting their families much later, much, much later. It used to be 21, and now it's mid-30s, late-30s into the 40s and late 40s, which is quite astounding, uh, a shift. And um, as a result of that, a lot of women hit a fertility wall. And infertility is a huge mountain to climb for a lot of women. It's very expensive. So those are partial factors. Then there's the cost of raising children, which has skyrocketed. Uh, there is a complete breakdown of the child care system so that if you can find child care, as one person just told me, I pay more in child care than I do my monthly mortgage. I mean, that's how outrageous it's become. So those are the primary factors. And what kicked them into even higher gear was the pandemic. That brought a lot of people up short, worrying about job security. Um, so that was an issue. And then we have climate change. And many people I spoke with for this new book I'm working on about only children and parenting them, in the course of interviewing for this new book, um, climate change came up repeatedly. And people said things like, you know, I'm not going to bring a baby into this world. Who knows, you know, if we're going to have the resources. So while we think that's a light issue, it's a much bigger issue. And there was a Swedish study that was done uh, around climate change. And the conclusion was the one thing you can do to help climate change is have one fewer child. So, I mean, those are the basic, pretty much the basic um, reason we've seen this huge swing from the two-child family to what I'm calling the new normal, which is the only child family. Certainly lots of societal factors uh, and other trends impacting the current reality. You've been at the forefront of this area of research since the 1980s. Is there something in particular, Dr. Newman, that has really surprised and struck you about these shifts and this transition? There were so many surprising things, but 
What struck me the most was people are no longer apologizing for having one child. People don't feel they have to defend their position anymore. Um, the one child family has become accepted. And the other big thing I found is that um, the one child family is becoming a dynasty. And it's not just a one-off, one generation. Um, my favorite interview was a woman who is, there are four generations of only children in her family. And as she says, it's so good. Why mess it up? Why have another child? Um, but the pattern has been with the people I've been talking to for the last two years that um, one child is the way to go. It, it, they also feel it preserves their relationship with their partner or a spouse or a significant other, whatever you want to call that person. Um, they focus on preserving their marriage. And children are hard. Raising kids is not easy, and um, Pew Research uh, pointed that out in one of their studies. And I, I was kind of surprised by that. I never thought about it as hard. You kind of think about it as, oh, this is an ending. So on that note, Dr. Newman, what would you say are some specific considerations that parents of only children need to consider as they embark on raising that singleton? Well, I think they have to consider not focusing all their attention on that child, not making that child the center of attention, uh, putting boundaries in place giving that child um, responsibilities and chores. Um, and that one of the key things that parents of only children have to uh, be aware of and make a com is to make a community for their kids. Be sure their children have friends. Uh, you asked me about surprising. Surprising. This was surprising a number of people call their good friends, a lot of whom they've had for years and years and years, sisters and brothers. And one little girl called her dog her brother. Oh, you got me a brother when she got the dog. But um, having confidants and peers um, who, you know, people worry when they don't have a second child that they're not teaching their child um, skills, important skills uh, that people used to think you could only get from siblings, like sharing and being a good loser and those kinds of things, being respectful and empathetic. Um, you learn all that when you're out in, in daycare, kindergarten, school. Uh, so, you know, siblings are not essential. What's essential is that parents uh, raise their children. And parents, you know, we talk about siblings, but it's really parents who are the key teachers. Um, and you get siblings from ensconcing your child out in the world and not um, putting that child on a pedestal. On that note, it would seem to be a large challenge to intentionally prevent that child from being the center of attention if if he or she is an only child. So what tips and strategies can you share, especially in the world we currently live in, and this has been going on for the last several years, of helicopter parenting, of overprotecting when it comes to parenting, of trying to shield kids, uh, you know, from an outside world that is increasingly volatile and unpredictable. And now you've got an only child. And in many cases, as a, as a parent, you're it if that child is your only child. So what can you offer from that perspective? The biggest and mind you, easiest thing to do is pretend that you have four children 
you know, I'm pretty objective because I've done family both ways. And when I had my son, I said, okay, would I clear the table, his dishes? Would I, you know, we're talking about an older child. Um, would I make sure his every minute is occupied? I mean, that's a biggie for parents of um only children, they really worry that their child's alone too much. And that is not, alone time's good. That's a plus because it teaches children how to be by themselves, which they are. You know, as you grow up, you're more and more yourself and you need to entertain yourself and be happy with yourself. So that alone time has many, many benefits. And, um, that's definitely something you want to do. Give your child chores and expect them to be done. I mean, these all hinge on having more children in the house. Don't feel as if you have to be the perfect parent, that you have to do everything just right. And to the point you made earlier is um, this culture we live in of competitive parenting is super harmful. Stay out of it. You know, you're think of yourself, I'm good enough and good enough is good enough. And your child will thank you for not hovering, um, making sure you, your child's homework is perfect. Uh, kids learn from failure and the tendency of only child parents is to step in and help out and you think because you have one that um you can turn that child into a star and and that's another point i mean and this is probably true of a lot of parents but it comes up more with only child parents you're trying to, you, you have this notion in your head, even when the baby's in the womb and kicks, you said, oh, it's going to be a football player um, or reacts to music. Aha, I have a violinist. You need to keep your expectations in check and I might add lower them, but follow your child's lead in what he wants or she wants to do and not what you thought the, was going to be the path your child would take. When you talk about ensuring that that child, um, the singleton, has a community of some kind, how would you suggest a parent, and by the way, there are many single parents by choice of single children. That's another category we should keep in mind. How can a parent go about creating that community in the absence of siblings for that child? Oh, that one's easy. I like that question. <laughs> um, make sure uh, for holidays you're with other people, but involve your child in uh, giving activities. You know, if you donate to an organization, instead of just donating or going somewhere to help, Take your older child along with you. Um, all these ways, you can do it through your uh, religious organization. There are groups for single mothers. Uh, there are groups for parents of only children. Um, but ask around in your community. You, uh, you know, parents, parents build their child work their children's worlds around their friends. So hook up with friends of yours who have children, and it doesn't matter if they have an only child or three children. I mean, a, a number of only children uh, report they're visiting their friends who have siblings, and they come home and go, that was so hard. There's so much chaos in that house. I need to rest. Um, but expose them to kids in as many ways as possible. And they will, as they get older, build their own network. I mean, somebody told me that she's still friendly 
with her neighborhood gang. And the gang consisted of her and another little girl the same age. And they used to parole the street in their diapers. So, uh, and those that friendship lasted. They're now adults and they're still friendly. Um, these friends, think about who your friends are and your closest confidant and who you trust. It's not always a sibling. Siblings, I always like to say, are not all they're cracked up to be. If your sibling relationship is great, that's a bonus. But there's all kinds of rivalries, contentions, dealing with parental favoritism that chips away at a sibling relationship. And the only child does not have to deal with any of that. They do not have to have their ego and self-esteem knocked down on a daily basis. So, you know, that's something else parents of only ch children want to keep in mind. You know, you, you've got a calm, stable household and you have a child, you know, a child who's not going to feel terrible about herself. You know, it's so interesting because as you're talking, I'm thinking about the fact that while single child families are gaining an acceptance, as you've outlined, it almost sounds like what is also increasing is the potential pitfalls that they could find themselves in with all the external noise that you've outlined as well. Is that an accurate assessment? I'm not understanding that question. <laughs> okay. Well, there's lots of different external forces that intervene in parenting today. Is that more pronounced if you have a, a family with one child? Oh, I don't think so. I think multiple child families have the same issues with, um, let's talk about digital access, you know, screen time, you know. All parents are fighting that challenge. Um, outside influences, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, the internet, and what children are exposed to. That's not a single parent issue and single child issue. That's an issue across the board that all parents need to pay attention to. Dr. Newman, what would you say about uh, opportunities for single child families. What does that look like? Could you give us some examples? Well, the opportunities come from the a lot from the relationship they have with their parents. There is there are huge benefits that expand the opportunities. For example, because only children with adults more, their vocabularies tend to be greater. Their verbal abilities tend to be greater. Um, there's a uh, decided uh, closeness that um, gives an only child a sense of security when he or she goes out in the world. Um, so, and, and for only children as they get older and older and go into the workforce, uh, they have a, a confidence and it goes back to they haven't been had their self-esteem chipped away at. Uh, and they're more likely to be a team player, even though you would think the opposite. Um, because, you know, even as young children, they know their turn will always come. And they don't, if their parents are doing a good job, they don't need to be center stage. So they make um, excellent employees. That's interesting. Now, along that same line, in that same vein, what would you say are some common myths uh, about single child families that we, you know, should correct and address? Okay, the biggie is the stereotypes. I mean, the idea that only children are lonely, that they're selfish, that they're ag aggressive, that they're bossy, they don't care about other people. Um that they're essentially what China was calling decades ago little emperors. Um, none of that has held up to the new science. You know, in the 1896, I believe, um, 
a psychologist, G. Stanley Hall, called uh, being an only child a disease in itself. Well, it's clearly not that. And, you know, study after study, hundreds of them have uh, proven him otherwise. So, the, the, you know, parents will say, my child, my only child's not selfish. She's willing to share all the time. Um, and they are not lonely. I mean, the reality is, how can you be lonely in this digital age? You know, and if you look at the pandemic, all kids were locked up and had to rely on what we're doing back and forth. Um, so it, it just, the myths haven't held up to scrutiny at all. And um, people in general are not even commenting on them. I mean, it's not something parents of only children have to worry about anymore. Um, and what I've seen over the decades is that parents of one child have become intensely savvy about child rearing and about the fact that they have one child, they need to get that child socialized early and continue that. Um, they understand that they're not raising a mini adult, that they don't want to take that child to uh, adult restaurants where the courses go on forever or concerts that are endless and way above their interest level. Um, they realize that they need to keep their kid a kid. That's that's the biggie. Let's talk a little bit more about the pandemic and its impact um, on single child families. You know, presumably during lockdowns, et cetera, um, you know, parents of single children, that was it. That family unit was it for that child. Then you get back into going into school again, going to school again and the social interaction and all the activities and things after, you know, in many cases, pretty much a two year cutoff. What have you seen or, you know, through your research, um, have you been able to glean from the impact of that transition for single child families and particular the singleton going back into the world? I think the adjustment, what I've seen is the adjustment has been difficult across the board. I did not see a marked difference between having one child or three children in the house. Um, what I did see is that many parents after the pandemic are gun shy about having a second child. Um, that was that was to me was the most obvious and uh, biggest impact. You know, and children adjust. You know, no matter you know, they just got to go with the flow at some point. Not all, because yes, we have increased depression and anxiety among teenagers from the pandemic, but essentially, uh, they bounce back. I think uh, what. I didn't see a difference between one child or two or three in um, going back out. I, I mean, going back out was scary for everybody. Absolutely. Dr. Newman, what would you offer or could you offer as tips or strategies for a couple, let's say both of whom uh, came from families with siblings who now have intentionally chosen to have only one child? What would you suggest their starting point be in terms of laying a solid foundation for themselves as parents of this single child? Think of think of yourselves as far more important than having another child and a sibling in the house because you, as I said earlier, are the best teachers. And um, just go forward. Don't worry about being a perfect parent. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. You may feel because you have one child, you need to do a better job and you can do a more efficient job because you have more resources and more time. But that's not necessarily true. Um, and I go back to my favorite is 
pretend you have four kids in that house and how would you handle them? And um, be realistic, lower your expectations. Only children know that the pressure is on them, that they have the only report card coming home or they're the only one on the little league team or the soccer team who's going to score points and make goals. Um, so, you know, that's important. And um, have fun, I think. Enjoy uh, each first and last. And uh, one mother said, I'm really good with having raise my child. I don't need to repeat any of the stages. I stayed focused. I stayed absolutely focused on each stage uh, and got really into it. And so I'm good with one. And the rest of the world, uh, if you look at the EU, 49% of the countries in the uh, EU have one child. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, and, you know, if we follow European countries, we're well on our way. A city like Seattle has 47% of families with one child. Uh, major metropolitan areas, the number keeps growing and growing. So, uh, you know, the only child family is the fastest growing family unit, according to Gallup and Pew and all the other mega research companies. So um, parents of only children should be rejoicing. They're in with the crowd. <laughs> Dr. Newman, another aspect of your story that is really quite interesting, in addition to this area of study, is your lived experience and how you entered this whole world of, of single uh, children. Uh, you were a stepmother of four first, before becoming a mother of one. What did that trajectory uh, teach you uh, about becoming or being a mother of a singleton? Well, it taught me that I couldn't let him be the rising star in the family, that he had to be part of a family. He had to contribute. Um he had to learn how to do dishes as soon as he got old enough. He learned how to do laundry. Um, and interestingly, uh, we sent him to camp where you had to do your own laundry at one point. And he was so proud of himself. He said, I had to teach my friend how to do laundry. I don't know what's wrong with his mother. And that particular child had two other siblings and none of those kids could do laundry. So he, you know, your kids like that responsibility, even though they complain, they feel they're contributing to the family and they're proud of themselves when they can accomplish something. Uh, I also learned that um, I had to tell people not to bring something for my son every time they visited that I don't like him looking down to see if everybody has a shopping bag um, when they visit. I put restraints on the grandparents in the gift department. Um, so these were all things I learned. I was very big on sharing. And um, if there was one piece of cake left, I said, we're going to share that. Each person is going to get a third of that piece. Um, you just all those things you would do normally if you had siblings. You you have to clean up your toys. You know, as a parent of one, it's much easier to pick up your kids' dirty clothes, to uh, do the dishes, to sweep the front walk, whatever the chores are at your house. But it does not help your child if you do that. It does not build any kind of resilience. And I also learned you can't do homework for four children. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, let your only child do his own work, fail, and 
learn what he needs to learn. Um, Don't step in. This goes back to the point of helicopter parenting. Don't pick him up when he's learning to walk. Let him get himself up. Uh, And that just goes on. uh, You know, don't go interfere in his disagreements with friends, unless, of course, it's a safety issue. But uh, step back and let him build his own resilience by taking care of himself rather than you as the parent of one. It's so easy. And it's not as easy to do that when you have more kids, although there's a lot of helicopter parents in all family sizes today. As you've outlined, we've come a long way in terms of acceptance and awareness of single child families. What more, if anything, would you like to see happening in that realm in general? From your perspective as a researcher, as an author, um, as a, you know, a previous stepmother and as a mother of a single child yourself, what more needs to be done? Well, there are a few stragglers who are still judgmental. (laughs) <laughs> we need to abandon those people. Uh, and parents of one still need to toughen up and not be influenced by those judgmental people. Realize that um, they're living in the dark ages. They don't understand that um The new science says the only child family is literally taking over um, and that um, large families will be in the minority. I mean, large, large families already are um, because the expense is ridiculous. You know, it's just too hard. And um, that's... I think I go, I keep going back to you're a good enough parent and you are a family, whether you have one, five or six children. There's no science out there that proves one family size is better than another. Doesn't exist. You have to do what feels good to you, uh, what makes you feel complete. Uh, and take take care of yourself because the best parents are parents who know what they want or explore what they want. They take care of themselves. They block out time for themselves um, because if you're a happy parent, you're going to have a happy child. Lots of wonderful food for thought. Dr. Susan Newman, social psychologist, author, Thank you so much for sharing your time and your insight with us today. Thank you.